This is the World Organic News for the week ending 12th of March 2018. John Moore reporting. As I discussed last month with the new vision statement for the podcast and blog, Decarbonise the Air and Recarbonise the Soil, I'm calling on my listeners to put forward ideas for an interview episode each month. If you know anyone who is doing either part of the vision, I'd love to hear from them, or indeed from you, if you are on the front line doing the work. This week we have an article from the ABC News site entitled While Politicians Question the Reality of Climate Change, Farmers and Business Act. This article is the written version of a TV program aired last Monday night here in the Antipodes. The title pretty much says it all, but let's dig a little deeper. Quote David Brewer has been growing vines and making wine at his Temple Brewer Vineyard in the Mount Lofty Ranges in South Australia since 1978. In his vineyard laboratory, weather records for every vintage for nearly 40 years are stacked in plastic folders. They clearly show a steady increase in maximum temperatures over that time of about one degree. Might seem like a relatively small change, but the impact has been dramatic. And further from the article, 34 years ago we used to pick in the middle of March, he said. Now we're picking in the middle of February, end quote. Grapes have always been a marker of world climactic conditions. During the medieval warm period, when Vikings were able to navigate a relatively ice-free North Atlantic, reaching Newfoundland as well as colonising Iceland and Greenland, grapevines were growing in England. Because grapes are a perennial crop, they are in the ground for many years. Planting requires a commitment to the future. Changes, rapid changes in climate, can have catastrophic effects on the grower. David Brewer's quote shows above shows how rapid change in a relatively short period. Clearly, N equals 1 is not reason to raise concerns, but the article on the TV program goes on to talk with a winemaking company with weather records going back much further. Quote, About 800 kilometres to the east of Temple Brewer, Ross Brown from Brown Brothers Wines has an even longer record on, weather record on file. His family has been making wine in Millowa, Victoria for almost 130 years. Mr Brown says he used, used to be a climate change sceptic, but his vintage charts are indicating things have changed. In Millowa, Brown Brothers is also picking earlier and their records show temperatures are rising. Some of the cool climate varieties families always, his family always used to grow here, like Pinot Noir and Sparkling White, have now become too unreliable for the company so they have moved its operation to cooler country in Tasmania, end quote. If this is affecting wine growers, it will also be affecting orchardists, soft fruit growers and pretty much anyone in agriculture. The perennial growers have movement issues, that is, vines and trees are pretty much going to stay where they are. Cereal growers and grazers have a, graziers have a little more flexibility, but not as much as they'd like. The real punch from the article and the program came at the end. Farmers in Australia don't receive subsidies, don't receive the subsidies that US and EU farmers do. They are, as a result of Australia being part of the Cairns Group, there's a link in the show notes, free traders, even if they'd happily receive subsidies. However, all the other regulatory requirements for businesses do apply to the agricultural sector and things are changing. Quote, Brown Brothers is a big operation. Their winemaking is on an industrial scale and the decision to adapt to the changing weather was driven by the company's board. It is a shift being seen in boardrooms across the country. Corporate Australia has been warned. The changing climate is something they can no longer ignore. Last November, Jeff Summerhays, an executive member of the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, told business climate change posed material risk to the entire financial system. His message was that boards and directors had a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to their shareholders to take this into account. He cited legal opinion that found that company directors who failed to consider and disclose climate risk could be in breach of the Corporations Act, end quote. Let that sink in. If companies ignore climate change in their risk assessments and shareholders suffer losses as a result, the boards of those companies are subject to legal action. While our federal government is controlled by a rump coalition party with ties to coal, gas and oil production, whose allies have complained about the ugliness of wind turbines and the beauty of coal mines, and I kid you not, legal opinion based upon science is taking reality into concern. 
For grape growers at the big end of town who have nowhere to go after Tasmania becomes too hot, those corporate entities who ignore climate change effects on their businesses will find themselves sued. Meanwhile, the National Party, whose supporters are on the front line of agriculture, keep pushing the world's biggest coal mine development in central Queensland, with the likelihood of it destroying aquifers, causing air pollution in the local area, and running the risk of shipping accidents in the Great Barrier Reef, an ecosystem suffering 50% coral bleaching from the last two summers. The dichotomy of political nonsense and the feed on the ground food producers is not helping anyone. As the agricultural sector is a free trading one as a result of government decisions, perhaps it's time to remove corporate subsidies from the energy sector, both fossil and renewable. The price of renewables is now less than fossil fuels without subsidies and falling as economies of scale, research efforts and price signals drive demand. In another article from the ABC, Solar Power, What Happens When We Start Producing More Electricity Than We Can Consume? Quote, While Australia leads the world in the use of rooftop solar power, some experts say there will soon be too much power coming online, and governments will have little choice but to cut subsidies. Government figures show 3.5 million solar panels were installed on Australian roofs last year, an average of almost 10,000 a day. That is a 41% increase on the previous year, driven by the twin incentives of cheaper solar panels from China and rising power bills, end quote. The obvious answer when too much power is being produced is to save the excess, not punish the producers. I don't know, maybe some sort of battery could help? I've discussed pump storage in earlier episodes, and that's a safe, proven, relatively inexpensive form of storage. What it all comes down to is this. The climate is changing, the evidence from the agricultural sector is overwhelming, the federal government in Australia is, if not in the pockets of fossil fuel producers, at least inclined to accept their arguments. What's happening to science-based policy in the US doesn't bear thinking about, but I will have an episode on that soon. While all that's going on, individual households are following the obvious price signals and throwing PV cells on their roofs. The odd one out in this story is the government. If only there was some way we could change government and some way we could have an actual real choice between alternatives. The Conservative coalition in power now bows to fossil fuel types. The Labor opposition does so through the mining unions, so the same thing. Where is a rational, evidence-based party that could step into the breach before Paris COP looks like a fine ideal, but not a reality? And with that, I'll draw this episode to a conclusion. Remember, decarbonise the air, recarbonise the soil. As a podcast listener, you may be thinking of producing your own podcast, but you're not sure where to begin. Drop over to mrjohnmoore.com and check out my course. I've been teaching this at community colleges around town and have developed an online version. There's a link in the show note. Classes start whenever you're ready and you can go through them as quickly or as slowly as you like. I'd really love to help you start communicating this way. And a transcript of this episode is available at worldorganicnews.com. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week. (laughs) 